Good evening, everyone. This is Dolores Cannon with the Metaphysical Hour. We're live tonight on the dynamic 4th of July. I guess you're going to be out there shooting fireworks after a while, but then we don't know. It goes all over the world. Some places don't have fireworks tonight. (laughs) Okay, but it is a holiday. But I think they'll be listening. In the United States, it's a holiday. In the United States, okay. All right, but it's live tonight on July the 4th, 2014. And we have a guest, but before I begin, I want to give out the toll-free number that anyone can call in if you want to ask questions. Of our guest. Yes, I would prefer you would keep your questions to the guest and not direct them to me. Okay, the toll-free number is 1-888-627-6008. 1-888-627-6008. And our guest tonight is Jack Churchward. Jack, uh, you're in Florida, aren't you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I know you're ahead of us in time, but I was didn't remember exactly oh. where you are. Oh, are you seeing anything of that hurricane that can, went through there? Uh, I didn't. It was on the uh, it was on the right coast, and I'm on the left coast. Oh, okay. So you didn't notice anything? Not much. The uh, we we are getting some rain now, though. Okay. Yeah, you're on the Gulf side then. Correct. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, Jack Churchward is one of our authors. And he just spoke at our transformation conference, which we just had a few weeks ago. I'm still recovering. Are you, Jack? No, I had a a great time. I'm recovering from (laughs) getting prepared previously, but everything everything went fine as far as I was concerned. Oh, It was a a wonderful conference. Uh, We had a lot of compliments. Oh, absolutely. It was fantastic. I think it was one of the best we've had. But my job is trying to keep everything running smoothly, and so it's... It's work, but anything is work. Okay, but we're going to have Jack tonight talk about his new book. He's been on the show before because we published one of his books, and now his second book. But um, those out there who have been in metaphysics for quite a while should know his great-grandfather, who was James Churchward. Yeah, get the names right this time. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Jack, Julie said when I introduced you, I kept switching the names around, calling you James. <laughs> okay. I, uh, they know who I'm talking about and who you're talking about, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. But James Churchward uh, is famous now. He wasn't famous whenever it happened. He was in much controversy. But he's the first one who wrote about Moo, which we now call Lemuria the continent that was in the Pacific. And uh, his great-grandfather wrote these books about it. And over time, he still considered a great authority on it. But Jack has done a lot of research, and he brought back his great-grandfather's work. And we published the first book, which on Lemuria, Lifting the Veil on Moon. And But now he has a second book, the Stone Tablets of Mu, and this is some information on James Churchward that has never been published, and that's what I like. I always like finding lost information and bringing it back to the public now. So we're going to talk with Jack tonight about this new book of the information that his great-grandfather had found. Okay, Jack, but first you want to tell him about yourself? Certainly, uh yeah. Uh, my name's Jack. I'm, uh, as Dolores mentioned, uh, my great grandfather was James Churchward. I was born, born and raised in, in Florida. I uh, was an Eagle Scout. Went and joined the Navy, and uh, after the Navy, I came back, went to college, and I've been employed as an engineer for thirty some over thirty years with uh, an international aerospace firm, and I. Uh, after engaging in some political activities uh, in the 90s, I suffered some personal setbacks and had some things that uh, I went through that I wanted to overcome, and we overcame them. And I 
then took it upon myself to start to look at my great grandfather's works, which uh, lots of people had been sending me emails and asking me questions my whole life, and obviously I had didn't take the opportunity to to do it previously. I'd been a little busy, and anyway, my family wasn't that enamored of his theories. So uh, a few years ago, in 2005, I started studying my great grandfather's works and looking at what his theories were and and what kind of man he was and what kind of life he led. And so in 2011, uh, thankfully, I had the first book published, Lifting the Veil on the Lost Continent of Pooh, Motherland of Men. And this year, the second book, The Stone Tablets of Moo, which is which is uh, contains copies of stone tablets found by William Niven near Mexico City, uh, is to be printed. It's like as Dolores mentioned, it's uh, be the first time it will be in print. Yeah, because uh, James never printed that for public, uh, you know, display, did he? That's correct. He uh, in for Christmas 1927, he gave a 38-page uh, handwritten document to his publisher. He had just received some images of some of the tablets that William Niven had been finding in uh, um, near Mexico City on his digs, and James was able to translate them and using what he had learned in India, and he became. Uh, he handed this over, and it went into his his uh, publisher Edwin Rudge. It went into his personal papers in the University of California library system, and, and was kept there. So you kind of organized it and put it all together, didn't you? Well, I wanted to make sure that uh, it first of all that the original document uh, reached. I, I was. I had read about it ever since I started the, the, uh, my research, and so it was great to actually receive a copy. But me having a copy isn't like everybody else being able to to also see a copy. So that's one one of the reasons that I undertook the project to get make the book available. Yeah, because I'm always looking for lost knowledge, and this is definitely lost knowledge. But uh, this David Niven was an archaeologist, wasn't he? Uh, William Niven, but yes. William. I'm thinking David Niven is the movie star. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have a thing with names, right? <laughs> yeah, I am. Okay, William Niven was an archaeologist, wasn't he? Well, at, m moreover, he was a, a mineralogist and oh. had, had engaged quite a bit in that. And in 1891, while he was in Guerrero State, he was visiting the governor to talk about some mining rights. And... On his way out, he, after uh, seeing some of the artifacts that the governor had collected from this area, he went out and spent, on his way back to Mexico City, he took it upon himself to explore the ruins, and I'm, I'm guessing that that's when he caught his archaeology bug. Mm-hmm. And... But how did he find them? You said they're... More than thirty feet below the surface, aren't they? Well, that's correct. He uh, he originally started the uh, digs that became known as Niven's Buried Cities in 1910, when he and his family moved to Mexico City, and he opened up a storefront there. Uh, natives, the native people who uh, had been digging in the clay pits, were selling him artifacts, and he had been selling them. And when he discovered that he could pay one of them to show him where they came from. That's when he took it upon himself to to go out into the clay pits that had been mined since the time of the conquistadors to build all the buildings in Mexico City. And he found out where they were, did some survey digs, and then uh, started on a 200 square mile area close to uh, Santiago Ahuizacla and uh, Atzapalco which were near Mexico City, where they're now suburbs of Mexico City. Hmm. But back then they were uh, open land with farmers and whatnot, and he was able to make a deal with the farmer and, and maybe get some help from the local people that needed a, 
a hand and they'd do the digging and he'd do the uh, identification. From what I understand from reading his biography, he had a deal with the Mexican government so that the best of any of these artifacts he found would go to them and others he would be able to keep and sell in his storefront so that he could continue to continue the excavations on the weekends. Do you think he really realized what he had if he was just selling them to people? Well, some of them were were the were the tablets, and he didn't start finding the tablets that James uh, were uh, d- discusses in the book. He didn't find any of those tablets until 1921. But those other things that he found, like incense burners and all kinds of crazy things that uh, that showed him that there was a uh, civilization, which some people estimated to be maybe even hundreds of thousands of years old. Oh, wow. And so with that, he uh, kept on digging and, and finding everything he could. Because I know in the, in the book you said uh, he, he found walls, he found houses, and all kinds of things when the more he dug down. Right. Uh, his The walls, he said, uh, some of it contained uh, petrified wood, went, and he took that to mean that perhaps that these buildings were 50,000 years old. But he'd also found that the construction consisted of concrete uh, and wood, and that uh, there was masonry used. And it, additionally, some of the collapsed walls weren't completely collapsed that he discovered, and they had uh, paintings, uh, murals on the walls that he said that they ro- uh, rivaled those of India or India, I'm sorry, not India, Egypt and Greece and the Babylonians. So he said that he found some really amazing things there, including uh, a jewelry workshop complete with a with an oven and some very, very small, intricate molds for parts. Wow. <laughs> well, that, you know, that always brings up the theory that, you know, Egypt, there was an association with the uh, the old ancient American and Egypt, really. Well, that uh, that is raised in some of the coverage that I uh, wrote about, that I write about in the book. Some of the people thought that there were Atlanteans, uh, thought that the people were Atlanteans. Other people thought they were uh, Lemuro Atlanteans. It was the Theosophist that wrote an article on uh, on Niven's buried cities and and. They believe that some people came from the West, which were the Chinese people, and the other people came from the East, which would have been the uh, not the uh, Egyptians directly, but he. But they believe that it was the Atlanteans, and the Atlanteans split off and went one way and settled Egypt, and and the other way and and settled uh, Central America. Yes, I've in my work I found that the ones from Atlantis went to Egypt whenever Atlantis went down. That would make sense. They would go either way. And I think you said that that part of Mexico is supposed to be the remnants of, of Lemuria anyway, isn't it? Mo? Not no, uh I don't believe that that, that was mentioned. Of... Well what James uh did write about is that the people that were there and he called them Mayas, not, not the Mayas that we're familiar with, but the Mayas of, of Mu. And those, what James wrote about them, were that they were the ones that left the motherland and colonized the planet and, and were great okay. navigators and whatnot. Hmm. But they were the, uh, the Nikal Brotherhood, were the keepers of the knowledge. And he related that the tablets that, he, that Niven had discovered, he was able to decipher and place them into that context as being part of the the knowledge and wisdom of the Nikal Brotherhood. Because, you know, I've had others on the show who talk about, in the Smithsonian Institute, there's a lot of things that uh, they will never let anyone know about, and some of them were discovered in the Grand Canyon that were Egyptian Mm -hmm. artifacts. So I think that goes along with the idea there was a lot of other people here that nobody... The historians don't talk about. Well, uh, some of the findings that uh, Mr. Niven found were were many small statues. In fact, uh, the number is in the thousands 
of small statues that he found it in the one ancient riverbed of uh, he said that there were uh, arabic types uh, people from africa people from southeast asia and asia uh, just, just a complete uh, metropolitan uh, mix of of people many different cultures and many different faces of many different peoples and these were all in that age range of uh, tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands years old, as one archaeologist put it. Hmm. Yeah, I know in the book you make a, a lot about this one you call the little Chinaman. He's a little statue that mm-hmm. looks like a Chinaman. James made quite a bit about that, and so did uh, Gavin Menzies. And Gavin Menzies in his book about 14, about 14, 22, or the, the book about how the, the Chinese discovered the earth. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> well, it, that was also covered. Um, the Chinese legation to Mexico visited Mr. Niven in his storefront in Mexico City. And went, as he's going through, he met the article in the newspaper from the time mentions that every the all the dress on the people were Chinese, and he, he pointed out Chinese writing and the fact that some of the incense burners were exactly as the same. And so he said that these were obviously Chinese people that that, uh, Mr. Niven had discovered. And the ruins were, you said, about 30 feet down. Correct. And uh, they were over some two... uh, it was incredible. 2,000 square miles is, is something that they mentioned, that these ruins were found. It was an enormous city from from the, what I've read. Hmm. And you said that they went through the levels. They even found a geological things like uh, the remains of volcanic eruptions as they went down, didn't you? Correct. The uh, The first layer is uh, bare, from, from my reading, the first layer was covered by volcanic ash, the, the next layer was covered by uh, the next layer of habitation was covered by some some kind of flood, and then there was a there's a one one more layer that was covered by two or three feet of other uh, earth and boulders and whatnot. So Great yes, they were quite you deep. A geological time frame right there. Hi. Yes. Historical hmm. happening. Yeah. I'm surprised that, well, I know the archaeologists didn't give your great-grandfather that much uh, credibility, but I'm surprised they wouldn't have wanted to investigate this more. Well, that, there there might be some other reasons to that, and being that uh, the, the location of the tablets is, is not known. But, I mean, um, there, there were some that, that Mr. Niven was attempting to remove from Mexico that he rightly believed were his and that, that should be going with him back to Mex- uh, back to uh, Texas when he moved back to Austin. And from what I understand from my reading, that he was unable to get the permits and took it upon himself to fer- very carefully pack everything up and bury it in someone's yard in Veracruz. <laughs> oh. And it's un- <laughs> and it's un- I don't know I don't know who would know whose yard it was and. <laughs> But all those tablets and all those artifacts have been buried in a uh, in someone's property. In in Mexico, or who knows? In in Mexico, in near Veracruz, in Veracruz. He oh, was going, you're going to have everybody seeking buried treasure now. <laughs> well, they were. Uh, it, it's 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 not like I'm making this up. It, it came from uh, Niven's biography. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Buried cities and forgotten gods. He mentions it very quickly in, in, in near the end of the book. Have you now, thought about going down there and seeing if you could find it? <laughs> I, w- I wouldn't know where to start. I have engaged. <laughs> I have so started cool. to engage the Mexican government because I discovered some letters in the my great-grandfather's nephew. I obtained some of his correspondence a few years ago and was able to see in there some correspondence from the Mexican government. They were very interested in if he knew any information about Niven's artifacts or Niven's tablets or anything. And eventually it got to the point where I believe 
uh, Howard Kersey, my great-grandfather's uncle, was um, actually taken or invited to the New York consulate of, of the Mexican government to discuss whether or not the artifacts were available or around or anything. And from what I understand, he would write a put down essentially what was his reply. And each time he wrote back that he didn't know anything about it, didn't have any of their correspondence, and didn't have any of the artifacts. Mm -hmm. So I hope that by, with an inquiry to the Mexican government, they'll, we can interact somewhat and maybe find out maybe they have already found them and that they're in, in a library or a museum somewhere on display. Because then you said they took everything that uh, he had in the storefront, then it, it was taken or what? No, he was. He, I believe he packed it up to take that's it back to he, Texas with him. That's the part he packed up, what he had in the store. Correct. But all mm -hmm. the best of all the artifacts he had already provided to the National Museum of Mexico City, in Mexico City. Yeah, I thought he said in the book that there were some in a museum, and that's the one in Mexico City? Yes, I believe so. Some of the... So the other... I'm not, I believe that more of the... Uh, of the implements as opposed to the, the tablets, the, the incense burners and and the other things that he found. So the majority of it then, we don't know where it went then. That's correct. And lots of people have been looking for it. And like I said, <laughs> even including the Mexican government. So hopefully they'll know if they found it or maybe somebody's already went out in their backyard and dug them up, and maybe they're on display somewhere. Yeah, they probably didn't know what they had. Oh, it sounds like a basis of a movie to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was what I was saying when you sent the manuscript to me. I said, well, tell, show us on a map or something where these are, and you're going to have everybody going there. But you said it wouldn't do any good because Mexico City is built over that uh, location now. Yes, quite. Um, the urbanization of the Mexico City has, has been skyrocketing over the last uh, 80 years now, and, and it's just, uh, it's all a concrete jungle. But I imagine that along the way that while they were digging foundations for different uh, buildings and, and infrastructure, that they probably ran into some of the artifacts, and hopefully those were uh, kept and put in the museums. But it's and studied. hard to say if they went down 30 feet. That's true. On the foundation. Well, but his dig site, it was he had exposed. I mean, what happened to that? I mean, did they just cover it back up and then start building on top of it? Quite possibly. Wow. Uh -huh. I was thinking if they were putting up buildings, did they go down 330 feet? <laughs> well, if they were digging uh, pipes or subways or something like that, they might have intersected some of it down there. Well, I remember seeing something on the news, this has been several years ago, where they were digging subways in down in Mexico City, and they came across a whole lot of stuff, and they had archaeologists in there to see it, and they said it was like lost um, findings. But I can't, I don't know where I saw that now, but it was the remains of a lost city. Hmm. So that would make sense if that's how they would find it, by digging like that. Yeah, that big. Yeah. And when we were in Athens, they said every time somebody digs in their garden, they find something. Yes, I'm sure of that. They said if they do, they're supposed to, if, if they're building a building or anything, they're supposed to stop everything and call the archaeologists. So they said if they're digging in their garden and find something, they just cover it all back up. They don't tell anyone. <laughs> they didn't want anybody coming in there messing with their yard. <laughs> I don't blame them. But only a lot of places still left like that in the world. <laughs> but to me, it's the most amazing about how old it is. Because um, that would be a civilization older, would be older than the pyramids, older than Egypt. That's correct. 
So it kind of throws all the archaeologist date lines out the window. But I'm not sure that he had any of the tools to accurately date it. For instance, mm -hmm. the, his uh, association with the man who owned the lease on the Petrified Forest, he had earlier in his career had gone into partnership with him while he was at, uh, at, at one of the mineral shows that went during his activities as a mineralogist. And they opened up a storefront in New York City. He was selling some of the petrified forest artifacts, the petrified wood and whatnot. And he took it upon himself to, from the dating of that petrified wood as 50,000 years, that's why he took, that's why he gave the estimated the age of those to be 50,000 years because he found some petrified wood there. Has it ever been re, I mean, any of these things, have they been retested or redated to confirm or dispute? Well, I'm not sure that there was any organic material available. Mm -hmm. Usually they use uh, maybe charcoal from a fire or something that's in the, that's uh, in situ with, with the artifact so that they can properly anal analyze it. And I don't believe any. And I'm not sure that there's tools that have been available to them. But these little figures, um, because they couldn't really date them, all they know is they didn't fit with the history of all these different races that they represent. That's correct. You know, I can remember, you know, Eric Von Donneken, uh, when his book first came out, what was that, the 60s, 70s? One of his first books, he talked about going down in caves, and I think it was in Mexico, and this was a place where there was very dangerous because they had all these uh, tribes that didn't want a white man in there. And they said he went down in these caves and found all kinds of little figures. And it's in one of his early books that has pictures. I wonder if they could be along the same thing. Okay. Have you ever heard of that, Eric Von Donneken doing that? Uh, no, I'm not aware of that, no. I'll have to look it up because I have all of his old books. But there was one, he said they could only had a certain length of time to stay down there because the tribes didn't want them in that area and it was very dangerous. So that would be digging down. Caves would be way down in the earth. That'd be cr that Yes. Could be the same city if it was that big. We're sitting on all this stuff and we don't even know it. Exactly. We have no idea. What's underneath us in the earth. <laughs> when we were in Newgrange in Ireland. That's older than the pyramids. So we're finding a lot of things that are older than the pyramids. Right. Mm -hmm. But they're all together. Well, it was above ground, but... Not by much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hmm. Well, I think that's fascinating. And I really like your curiosity, too, that you want to explore, to, to bring this information back. Well, I'm not sure that... I'm, I'm, I'm taking undertaking the opportunity... I'm taking the opportunity to uh, research my great-grandfather's works due to all the questions I've been asked. And... The fact that I, I did take quite a negative approach earlier in my life. My uh, family was not all always, well, my family was never uh, fans of my great-grandfather. And yeah. we're not very happy with him and the way he behaved. They, and I believe they uh, had it out for him when they, he tried to discuss when he wrote his books and whatnot. They they didn't believe a word of it, and that was and that was what was passed down to me. Mm. At least they weren't destroyed, anyway. No, we, there are some a few things still available. So, how does the family feel about you resurrecting <laughs> all, this. all of this? I, I'm I'm the last church ward, other oh, than okay. my son, so. I, I could talk to my sister, but in fact, I, I'm, I, I sent her a copy of the book already. But um, I hope that uh, I'm, I don't I haven't found any person that I mean, it's not like I'm uh, 
solidifying his work, yeah, adding any are. validity. I'm just taking it upon my, taking it upon myself to to research it and provide the results of my research to whomever might wish to read further information. Mm -hmm. Well, I admire you for doing it because uh, it is bringing back information that could have been easily lost. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine what uh, James Churchward felt when everybody was criticizing him. I know that he got some very unfavorable remarks, but then on the other hand, he did uh, have quite a following of individuals who believed in him. Well, that's the trailblazers. That's what they do. Yes, the uh, the pioneers get the arrows, and the and the yeah. settlers and the settlers get the homes. <laughs> what was the last part? And the settlers get the homes. There you go. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> okay, because uh, I remember in the first book you uh, you uh, republished here uh, that. James Churchward found this information when he was living in Tibet among these, um, what do I say, priests. So they and they lived there so long they allowed him to look into the ancient records and things. Well, he it was he wrote in his books that it was in India that he had India. I thought it was in Tibet. Well, he said that later on he had seen uh, various manuscripts in Tibet, but other than. But he didn't. He in most of his books, he took it upon himself to keep the location of the monastery safe and not tell anybody. But in mm -hmm. in the late in nineteen in the nineteen nineties, one of his old books that was uh, a gift to his nephew Howard Carsey, and was only supposed to be meant to be given to Howard Carsey, it wasn't supposed to be made public. It was published by uh, Brotherhood of Life Publishing. And it's called the uh, Books of the Golden Age, and in it he does reference um, the name of the monastery in Tibet. Unfortunately, I have looked at maps. I have uh, I've spoken with uh, one of the leaders of one of the main schools of, of Tibetan Buddhism, and he has mentioned that he's also looked into it after I mentioned it to him, and he had spoken with his all his abbots and and sent out the feelers and there was no that nothing came back to say yes there it's still there or yes it was there because it was under James James also believed that the monastery that was up there it wasn't a, it wasn't a Tibetan Buddhist monastery it was still run by the Nikal Brotherhood from the you know the earliest stages of time. Well, that's like. Um but like the Vatican, you know, people can't get in there, and it has all these records. So some of these places did preserve the records over thousands of years, and he became friends with them. He lived with them. So that was how he eventually got to see these, and they had to be translated. But yet people thought he was making the whole everything up. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking about then versus now and how research <laughs> was done and what he was doing and traveling. I mean, even the traveling was much different than it is now. Yeah. What he would have undergone to do all of this. And to live in those places for such a long time mm -hmm. to get the information. Well, all the evidence... What? Well, all, all the evidence I've found uh, indicates that he spent uh, at least 10 years, maybe 9 or 10 years in Sri Lanka and own tea mm. plantations there. And you know, you don't have to live among these people a long time to get their trust mm -hmm. to let them let you see these things. Well, see, that alone would have put him in a really different category. He's gone to all these places, and so people wouldn't, they would have a hard time identifying with that. Probably. Yeah. Not in the world at those days. Nobody went anywhere. Right. They didn't have airliners or anything. I think it was all done by shipping or walking. Yeah. Mm. But then to have he found all of this, and then to have everybody be criticizing him, saying he was making it up because it couldn't be a fan of continent out in the Pacific. Well, it, it couldn't have been that many people against it. Uh, more correspondence that I found from 
from Howard Karras. He said that in 1955, they were still selling 1,000 copies of The Lost Continent of Moo every year. Mm. And that was... So it has survived anyway. Okay. Correct. And he died in 35, so 36 actually. So 19 years after his death, they were still selling copies of his books. And well, actually, they're still co- selling them today. Yeah, they're selling your edition. <laughs> well, they're, they're, you're you're selling my edition, uh, but yeah. uh, there's also other editions out there. Mm-hmm. On other, but you uh, say some of the ones that are being printed don't have the authority to do with that. Well, uh, from, from what I understand, the copyright was turned over, was signed over to my father or my, or myself in in the, in the seventies. And that was for, I think, The Lost Continent of Moo and, and maybe one other. And I haven't checked into it, but everybody's publishing them, and uh, I'm not sure that I could really do anything to to uh, bring them to, to justice, <laughs> or if there is such a thing as bringing them to justice. I'm glad that they're bringing out the information and, and providing it to everyone. But one... As long as they're doing it correctly. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, yeah, that really is a, a trailblazer there. Oh yeah. And even to have your own family think you're crazy. <laughs> well, but there again, see, he was gone. Uh, he didn't take the family with him, did he? Oh no, he didn't. Actually, uh, <laughs> after he'd been married about ten years, I believe he had a falling out with with his wife and my grandfather, who was the son his son, and they parted ways and went in different directions. Yeah, he said, you're never home, you're always traveling. <laughs> Who makes sense? Right. Hmm. But anyway, it is, uh, it's wonderful information. And that's what I liked about this latest book, is that uh, it's information that has never been published before. But we can't have everybody going down to Mexico City and start digging up the streets. Uh, you might have some very angry landowners. <laughs> they go in somebody's backyard and start digging it up. Because you give the location, but it's, you think it'd still be pretty hard to find. Well, actually, uh, it was I entered the names, and Google Earth just popped the names right up. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean they're still there, uh, but but what's the, pro- the the problem with it is that they've uh, Paved it over. Yeah, so that'd be a little difficult. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Otherwise, everybody would be going down there. Take a jackhammer with you people if you go. <laughs> <laughs> Was there anything uh, valuable, like gold or jewels or anything, that Niven found? Well, he did find, uh, he was actually his uh, his major occupation, I guess, before before he became the archaeologist, was as, was as a mineralogist. And he did uh, find mines and worked to get them open and running and actually work them with, with uh, the workforce. And uh, in, in one case, he actually worked on getting a, a boat run down the Balsas River, uh, I believe, to the Pacific, so that he could because there were they couldn't get a railroad into the area, so he was working on obtaining a a boat route so that they mm. could ship the ore down the river and get it out of the area. That was that was the hard part. They could find the gold, they just couldn't get it out of there. Oh, and I okay. guess it was a little difficult to take it out on mule train or or on donkey back, especially with the uh, level of bandits and outlaws that that were there at the time. It wasn't very safe. But so, when he was down digging up the cities, did he find, you know, gold and jewels and things or anything like that? Or was it just the little artifacts? Well, I, I, I did. Uh, he did mention that he did find a uh, goldsmith's shop, and oh. there were still some gold in some of it. I'm not sure that he found. It, he doesn't go into length and I, I itemize what he had found. And I don't remember reading about any gold or jewels or precious metals. Other Speaking precious of metals. Indiana Jones. <laughs> yes. Hmm. 
Well, I think you have found your calling anyway that you're uh, determined to get this information out. Well, I wanted to make it available so that everybody could see uh, a more complete picture of my great-grandfather. Well, what are you working on now? Or have you stopped? I, uh, I, I took it upon myself to, to take a, a, a short break. Uh, uh -huh. I'm, I, I've been talking with my wife, and perhaps the next uh, uh, point of research will be uh, about the Great Uyghur Empire and how that has the been great mentioned. What? The Great Uyghur Empire from from Central Asia. Uh, James wrote about it in, in most of his books. He wrote that there was a Great Uyghur Empire in Central Asia, and that was the primary, uh, the first and primary colony of the lost continent of Mu in Asia. Oh, and unfortunately, where they went there. And it was, unfortunately, he says it was wiped out, but uh, he, he mentions that they did find some uh, wonderful artifacts about him. It's also mentioned by Edgar Casey, and there is other literature about it. In fact, some of the Bosnian pyramids there, uh, I've heard talk that perhaps they think that elements of the great Uyghur Empire went there and built yeah. them. Yeah, I know we've heard of pyramids in China. And then the Bosnian. Yes, Bosnian one, too. Would they, uh, the Bosnian one, we had someone come at our UFO conference to speak about that. And they're just now beginning to excavate them, finding tunnels. Well, but uh, I also heard that they found pyramids in China, but they weren't letting people come into that area. Well, the, actually, those are those are near Xi'an, China, which was the ancient capital of both the Han and the Tang Dynasty. And those, they're not really pyramids; they're more like uh, flat-topped mounds of earth closer to, rather than looking like, like Egyptian pyramids, they look closer to what uh, is found in, in Mexico. But yeah, those, those kind. but those uh, pyramids, although they're saying that they're tens of thousands of years old, uh, most of them, there are local records and, and knowledge that those came from the Han Dynasty, which was to 200 B.C. to 200 A.D., and the Tang Dynasty, which was in the 8th and 9th century. So mm -hmm. they don't reach back to it as far as that. They're at least that's what, as... at least that's what they say on the on the ground there. They're not as old as the ones they found in Mexico. Then. That's yes, that's correct. Hmm. Well, to me, I think that would make sense then. That to Mexico they spread out. Well, that's what well, uh, Le Plongeon believed. Uh, Augustus Le Plongeon believed that the that's where uh, America, uh, yeah, American <laughs> uh, human civilization began in Central Asia, in in Mexico. Oh, that was, so they that always was, say it began in Africa. Yes, there's but some you think it, it started in Asia then, which would make sense. Well, there's also a camp that believes that uh, civilization came from uh, Central Asia, okay. and they call it the. I believe that some of them call it the Uyghur Empire, but I'm not sure if they've got things a little goofed up. Well, they said the alphabet and all those things began in Asia, but of course they had the different alpha, different kind than we do, but a lot of the things that the culture just sprung uh, all of a sudden there, and they were able to develop a lot of skills very quickly. That's what I've heard. So you said you were going to start. You want to start working on that. And what what um, what's involved when you start doing? Like, well, work on essentially, I, I I need to read lots of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be able to retain lots of stuff too. Absolutely. Make make not lots of little notes and little notebooks here and there. Hopefully, they'll all stay in one one big file, and then. Uh, sit down and, and organize it and just write it out. <laughs> like, that's the easy part, right? Yeah. <laughs> Is this something that uh, has not been published before? 
I'm, I'm not aware of any any writing about the, the Uyghur Empire. Now, maybe there are scholarly works that describe the historical Uyghur Empire from the 8th century, in uh, which was Mongolia. But I don't in believe... Mongolia, where Mongolia right. is now? Correct. Mm-hmm. And those, actually, they were church... Uh, chased out by the Kyrgyz, and the Uyghurs uh, went westward. Um, some of them even studying uh, or settling as far away as uh, Bulgaria and uh, Hungary. And, and uh, actually, the Magyars believe that they are descended from the Uyghurs. So that Magyar. takes on. Magyar, I'm thinking Magyar. I think is associated with Hungarians, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. But so, really, they're all interconnected. I guess when you come down to it, over there. They, they believe they're a Turkic people descended from the uh, Great Uyghurs, the Great Uyghur Empire that was that were chased out by the Kyrgyz, which and they uh, eventually settled in what is now uh, called Eastern Turkestan, or the Chinese government calls it Xinjiang. Hmm. But so, more even went even farther west and, and settled parts of Europe. I know we were in Istanbul. They were talking about how old that is there, mm-hmm. the Turkish Empire. That always has fascinated me, you know, the the ancient world, the ancient things like that. So, here you're right in the middle of it. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I enjoy uh, studying and finding out how, how perceptions change and our thoughts about history change. Over, have changed over the years. Uh-huh. I love research. To me, that's the meat of everything. And you love history, too. Oh, yeah, I love history and I love research. I like digging through a book. I said, when I'm writing a book, I could spend all day at the university library looking for one little tiny thing. And that, to me, is his heaven. <laughs> Other people wouldn't understand that. I understand that well, yes. <laughs> it's just like dotting that, dotting the I's and, and crossing the T's, just uh-huh. getting everything done. And as an engineer, I'm a I'm a detailed person. Yeah, you yeah. would be. <laughs> but I used to go to the university library here in Arkansas and uh, do my research. But I used to see all these kids in there, the college students, and I kept wondering, do they really realize what they have there? Because you know they weren't paying much attention. But nowadays, the kids do research on the Internet. They don't, know what, they don't know what real research is. Yeah, it's much easier to do a, a text search on a, on, a, on a Google PDF than it is to go and dig it out of the book. Right. Because yeah. I used to have the library find me books they didn't have through interlibrary loan. And sometimes there'd be only one copy in existence that would be in the Library of Congress, and they would send it for me to read it. To me, that that to me that's heaven. <laughs> well, that's that's another reason why I wanted to make this book the uh, copies of stone tablets found by William Niven near Santiago Ahuizacla near Mexico City. I, uh-huh. Those long titles are getting me. But, <laughs> but this, we had to, to cut the title down. <laughs> yes. Quite. But uh, you spoke at the Transformation Conference, and I think you had a really good reception. Thank you. And you did a workshop after that, didn't you? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm also uh, starting to to do a little more research on the side to to work on on a workshop called Lemuria or Moo. And I was asked that question at the conference. Uh, well, what's the difference between Lemuria and Mu? Well, if I had time, I could probably give a good answer, but we really didn't have the time then. And it would take it would take a while to, to differentiate how Lemuria is different than Mu, but there's there are subtle differences. I've always thought it was the same. Just a different name, but I was thought Mu was the same thing as Lemuria. There are there are so many different versions of Lemuria that I've found. Excuse me. Uh, that um, it makes it uh, very to, to make a blanket statement. I guess you can make that blanket statement, but 
there's just so many different theories of Lemuria. Would it be, or you may be indicating that maybe Lemuria was part of Mu? Uh, not following, not, no, I don't believe so. Okay. There are the, there are different theories. For instance, one theory believes that uh, Mu existed only as a zoological area. Oh, like a myth. And, and another uh, theory later thought that Lemuria was the birthplace of the human species in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And another theory has it that Lemuria was part of a problem of a continent that streaked across the Pacific Ocean and crashed into the United States and and glommed itself part of it glommed itself onto California. And it just it's all kinds of all over the place theories about Lemuria. Mm-hmm. And so I want to look into the various uh, theories that that are out there and see what they have in common and then make a comparison to Mu and let people make up their own minds whether or not Lemuria is Mu. Mm-hmm. Well, we were in Hawaii. Uh, they like to they like to say that is the remnants of Lemuria, especially the island of Kauai. Kauai. Mm-hmm. When we were on Kauai, that's the oldest one. And you said you felt things when we were there. Oh, that island talks to you. <laughs> vibrations and frequencies there. But they like to say that death islands are part of the remnants of Lemuria. Well, I'd like to hear any information. In fact, some one person did come to, up to me at the uh, Transformation Conference and mentioned that an archaeologist had just recently discovered some new ancient artifacts that put them put the history back uh, a lot earlier. The lady didn't know the exact details and, and passed me along a phone number, and I need to get in touch with them and find out just how far back these new discoveries put them. In a way? Correct, yes. Because hmm. a lot of that is new land, like um, the big island. Mm-hmm. But that's like the, like yeah. there's a ring they, there. They specifically said it was Kauai was the, was the one that was, because it was the mother island. Uh-huh. And they, they were specifically saying that, and I thought the islands were all the same age. But, yeah, that's, that's they were all the same. It was like, why wouldn't they all be that? But, but they were specifically saying Kauai. Hmm. Well, anyway, it's all interesting, and... This is what I like. That's what I like to publish, lost knowledge, <laughs> lost information. Okay, Jack, well, we're coming up to the time we're going to sign off. The hour has gone very fast. Tell people how they can get a hold of you if they want to contact you. Well, the easiest way is um, uh, my website is jack.churchward.com, and there are links on there to all my other resources, there's a page on each of my books. I've got links to my YouTube page. An even shorter one would be um, j.churchward.com. provides uh, links to every. That's just for links. And you mm-hmm. can get to links, all my links there. Mm-hmm. And that's Churchward, C-H-U-R-C-H-W-A-R-D. That's correct. J.churchward.com. Oh, okay. All right. Well, then if they want to get a hold of you, and maybe they know something out there that might help you. Yes, or they please. They know they're going to have questions. Absolutely, and the please. Book is, you said it's available now. Well, it's, it's due to be here on Monday, my understanding. Yeah, we was hoping to be here for the conference, yeah. but it had all kinds of things folded up. I don't know. It had its own timeline, Jack. Absolutely. <laughs> I understand. Karma. But it'll be here, <laughs> and then it'll be available. It's going. It'll be in the stores, right. and um, probably on Amazon mm-hmm. and on our website. It can be ordered. Right. And it's called the Stone Tablets of Moo. Okay. Well, it's time to sign off now. Thanks for coming on, Jack. No, thank you very much. I had a, a wonderful time uh, both at now and and the transformation conference. Okay. You keep writing and doing research. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening tonight. Good night. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos 
and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.